You are listening to a podcast from the Journey Church of the Highlands. It is our joy to share and release the gospel of God's love, grace, and Jesus' finished work on the cross. For more information, please visit awakenj.com. When I first started preaching, and this is kind of ironic, uh, here in January of 2012, when I became the pastor uh, of the church, I started to transition in. I gave a message, and I remember now, so I'm kind of laughing, because I, I came into this very nervous also, this particular message. And um, basically, I wanted to lay out a little bit of what I felt God put in my heart for a vision for this, this region, this particular body, and, just, and what, he was, what I felt like the Lord was saying. Um, for a long time, I'm not going to get into the story now, but many of you have heard it before. For a long time, uh, I was just going to a house church. I was getting my master's degree. I was disconnected from here. I would had no intention of going into ministry, to be honest with you, at that point in my life, around 2011. And although all this time, when I spent time with the Lord, the Lord was like downloading to me uh, revelation and insight into how to build and how to structure a church. And I was like, "What are you, Lord, what are you saying? Like, I don't see myself pastoring or anything like that. Maybe a house church kind of thing. I don't know. But at that point, it wasn't on my radar. And then God, you know, totally surprised me in late 2011 and brought me here. Um, but anyway, in January, when I stepped into leadership, I gave a message about this simple word that, that the Lord had uh, communicated and really, it was all about the cross and all about Christ and him crucified. Like that is 1 Corinthians, actually, where Paul says when he went into a church to start things, to get things going, actually to start a church in the first place, he said, I determined to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I determined to know nothing, no leadership teaching, no worship teaching, no spiritual warfare teaching. I determined to know nothing except one thing. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I felt like that was to be the focus of the next few years. And as we just centered ourselves on Christ and the full meaning of the cross, that there was going to be a, a, a form and an ignition released out of that. And so for those of you who are here that Sunday, I remember uh, sharing with you that that week on CNN, I was really struggling with this message, really wasn't sure how to communicate it because it just broke down every other thing we focus on, centering it on Christ. And I was on CNN that morning, and there was an article on CNN about Joplin, Missouri, which got hit with an F5 tornado, if you remember, in uh, early 2011. There was this article on CNN this day as I'm getting ready to, to give the message I see right on the front page of CNN, not just on like a little side story, but on the front page, I see a huge picture of a cross. And I click it, um, and I'll, I'll remind you of the uh, title of the, the article in a moment, but I click it, and the whole article is about um, how there was a hospital that was completely wiped out by this tornado. And it was, this article was about the hospital, but it was also about the resolve of the people of Joplin, Missouri, how they would come together and they were going to build a new hospital. But what was amazing and what this picture of the cross was, was all of the, the walls, the building, I mean, so much had gotten destroyed. There was debris everywhere, but there was this one wall and this cross that was remaining on the wall that did not fall in all the debris when everything else had fallen. This one singular cross, and the article said, with this cross, Joplin builds anew. And that was the name of the article on CNN and how they were, they were bringing this cross from the old site of the hospital to this new site. They were going to break ground, build a new foundation, and the cross was going to be the first thing leading the way to this new place of healing. So I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. God, oh, that's an awesome confirmation because that's exactly kind of the word that we had going into things here. And we've been on this three-year journey now for it. And so we have focused very much on the cross. By the way, I looked up the hospital again and I found out that the new hospital is gonna be fully intact next year, which is so cool because for those of you, uh, you know, who have been following along, we really believe next year is the end of this third year, the time when we really begin to step out into the fullness of our identity, into the beginning of the fullness of our identity as an influence and, uh, and, and, a, and a body of people, an army of people in this community and town. So we focused on that, and uh, we have laid a foundation, and I feel very much like, like Haggai this morning, the prophet, 
Haggai is such an important book for us. Really, if you've never read it before, get into this book. It's only two chapters of the Bible. It's, it's right in the middle, pretty much. But Haggai is speaking to a group of people who were about to build the temple. They were about to build a new temple, and he encourages them. They had already laid the foundation. And he says to them, listen, I know this foundation looks like nothing. It doesn't look like much to you. It just looks like, I mean, think about a foundation. It just looks like this giant slab in the ground in an open field. But he speaks to them and he encourages them and says, I want you to lift up your hearts and your eyes and know that I am building a structure here. I am establishing, God speaking, my kingdom. And the latter glory of this house is going to be greater than the former glory. Now, the people had seen the former glory. Some of them, the older ones, had seen the former glory of the temple, and now all they see is this little foundation, and they're like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see the fullness of all these promises coming forth. But Haggai tells them, listen, my spirit, God's spirit is amongst you. Get to work. Build this temple. Get ready because the Lord your God is going to do amazing things in your midst. And I kind of feel like that. As we're coming out of this foundation-building season, it's like, you know, we've seen a lot of amazing things in this church, a lot has happened in the last two years. It's, it's been awesome. We'll talk about some of that later today at the annual business meeting. But in many ways, we're still looking for the fullness of what God is wanting to release. And we're still looking for a lot of amazing things. We've talked about incredible things that come with the gospel package, right? The healing of God, the power of God, revival, awakening, all of that stuff, the full maturity of the bride of Christ we've talked about. And for many of us, we might look around and say, I, I don't know, I don't see that. <laughs> I don't, I don't always see that. All I see is this slab in the ground. But I'm telling you, there, is, there are so many hopes and dreams that the Lord has for his church, for his people all over and for this particular region. And he's calling us to come together to build, to work, and to get ready. So now, in this third year, we're in a season of time where we are coming together and we are forming. We are the beginning of forming into a new spiritual structure. There is a totally new church on the horizon. Totally new church. And I say that personally for us here, and I also mean that in a global sense too, because things are changing rapidly in the body of Christ. But there is a new church arising here. And so what I want to do at the onset of this year is I want to go back to 1 Corinthians, where we started, but now I want to look at some of the later chapters where Paul begins to talk about the gifts of the church. And if I could get the clicker, Scott or Celine, the clicker for the PowerPoint, I want to talk about the later chapters for Corinthians where Paul in the beginning, he talks about the foundation that he laid, Jesus Christ, Christ and him crucified. But later on, he begins to put some form around things. He begins to talk about leadership a little bit and the gifts and all the things that come out of that. So we're going to look particularly at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Okay, we're going to go through that a lot um, over the next few weeks and we're going to get into spiritual gifts and passions and dreams and all this kind of stuff because this is all a part of where we're headed in this third year since we began this kind of new groundbreaking work in 2012. Now, I think it's absolutely amazing that we took communion today. I wasn't planning on this at all with this particular message. It just happened to be Communion Sunday, but I was getting ready uh, for the message this week, and I was reading uh, 1 Corinthians 12, but the Lord kept bringing back to me uh, 1 Corinthians 11, right before chapter 12, and I kept getting drawn back to it. I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? And I just saw at the end of chapter 11 is this discussion on communion. It's all about communion and all about how to come together in communion. And so I just began to realize how everything, all the gifts, everything that you hear in, for, in chapter 12 and beyond, everything flows out of communion. Everything comes out of the communion table. And it's perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. It's so perfect that Rich talked about gifts today. You had that word on your heart to talk about people stepping into their gifts. That was pretty cool. That's exactly what I wanted to hit on, and it was right around the communion table that you did that. But out of the communion, out of our understanding of our common union with Christ, all right, and with one another, there are gifts, there are things that flow, that come forth, okay, in the body of Christ. Now, 
chapters 12 through 14 of Corinthians um, talks about the gifts and the functions of the body. And so this week, I want to start to talk a little bit about what holds this spiritual structure together, okay? We talked last week about cells in a body. You remember that? Who was here last week? We talked instead of this analogy of a physical temple, of building a wall, all right? We talked instead about actually we're building a body, a wall, a building, a temple. Stationary is kind of, it's, it's a very weak analogy because we're not a stationary physical structure. God is building a spiritual entity here. So we talked about the living stones of the body the living stones, which are the cells of the body of Christ. But the question I want to ask this morning is what holds the cells together? What's going to keep the cells together? Because before you go to lay bricks on a new foundation, on a new building, okay, you better have some cement, mortar or whatever, you know, to begin to put those bricks in place, right? To put those living stones in place. So we're going to gather some of that cement this morning. And in order to do that, I want to first look at a video. Um, this, I don't think Ralph Brucata is here today, but Ralph came up to me last week and he told me about this video. I had heard about it before, um, but I, I watched it this week and I was blown away by it because it just, um, it just talked about exactly what I want to get into and something about cells in the body. It's about a six-minute video. It's by uh, a conference Um, It's from a conference by Louis Gilglio, who is an evangelist, uh, speaker, international speaker, and he gave this uh, teaching about something that goes on in our body. It's really cool. So I want you to watch that. Are we, we good to go? Okay. I heard that. Know tonight that God will always hold you together, no matter what. It's by looking a little deeper into the human body, and it's a little protein molecule called laminin. That's about what I felt the first time I heard that. Long story short, The tour was winding down last time around. We were in Tyler, Texas. The night was over. A guy walks up to me. I wish I could tell you the whole story. It was so of God. Introduces himself to me. He says, how are you doing? I just want to say hello. I said, it's nice to meet you. He says, you guys winding the tour down. Uh, Where are you going to go from here? I said, well, I'm on my way back home to Atlanta, Georgia. He said, well, what's next for you? I said, I'm going to be preaching the next two Sundays for my pastor back in Atlanta. He said, oh, cool. What are you preaching on? I said, well, the series is on the glory of God and the human body. He said, that's really amazing. I'm a molecular biologist at the university down the road. G- give me your talk. And I was like, oh, wow. I wasn't quite yet ready to unload the talk for a molecular biologist. So I kind of stumbled through what I had and he's kind of being kind and gracious and like, "Uh uh-huh, that's good. And then he says, well, what's your big left hook? You gotta have a left hook, a big finish, right? I said, I don't have a left hook yet. He said, oh, Louie, oh man, your left hook is laminin. And I'm I'm totally blank on laminin. He goes, Louie, it's a cell adhesion molecule, protein molecule. Do you know about proteins? I'm like, no. He said, Louis, cells organize into certain molecular structures and that determines what protein there are. There are between 10 and 60,000 proteins in the human body. We don't even know how many proteins are in the human body. But one of them is a cell adhesion molecule. It's organized into this certain structure and that tells the cell what its job is in the body. And this one is a cell adhesion molecule. And I'm like, All right. He said, no, Louie, it's like the rebar of the human body. The steel they put in the concrete when they lay the foundations of things, it's that stuff. It's it's holding your membranes together. It's the glue of the human body, Louie. It's laminin. you got to tell them about laminin. And I'm like, I promise you, I'm going home and tell them about laminin. And I'm sure when I do, revival is going to sweep across the church and probably around the world when I tell them. He said, no, 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 no. you got to see laminin. Like, okay, let's see it. 
He said, no, 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 you need to go look it up online. You need to go Google laminin. I don't even know how to spell laminin. <laughs> Takes his card out, he writes on the back, L-A-M-I-N-I-N. -I -N. I'm like, okay, I cannot wait to get to my computer and get on Google, click on images, type in laminin, and I'm waiting, and these little thumbnails come up on the screen, and I'm like, That's laminin, the cell adhesion molecule. Woo! <laughs> I am so excited. I am beside myself. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I love laminin. I'm so fired up. <laughs> you should see laminin, I guess. That's the thing, right? Okay. Here is a scientific diagram of the laminin cell adhesion molecule that's holding your body together right now, okay? This is what I found right here. No, come on, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just crazy. I just can't believe it. I emailed that guy back so fast, I'm like, wow, 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 what in the world? He said, you want to see an actual laminin molecule? I'm like, oh, no, man. The diagram was cool for me. I'm happy with that. Don't, don't bother sending anything else. I'm like, yes! And he sends me this image, an electron microscopic image of an actual laminin protein molecule. It looks just like this. How crazy is that? That the stuff that holds our bodies together, that's holding the lining of your organs together, holding your skin on, is in the perfect shape of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately I'm thinking about the words of Paul in Colossians 1. You know this beautiful passage where Paul's talking about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He says, for by him, talking about Jesus Christ, all things have been created, things in heaven and things on earth. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. But then the next verse goes on to say this. It's crazy. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him, that is, in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. It's right, it's right there. I'm like, of course they do. Of course they do. Everything holds together in Jesus Christ. And he goes on at the end of this paragraph, and he just tells the story of grace. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. That's pretty powerful. Um, so I'm just going to go to this slide real quick. I don't have time to get into everything I wanted to talk about, but we, as I said, are going to be diving into a lot of stuff about the body coming together, and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians. Now, Paul called himself a master builder, okay? Paul knew how to build a church, okay? He set a pretty good foundation, okay, because of his ministry, and several others at the time, we're all in a church today. That's pretty good longevity of your, uh, of your business plan, okay? So he, uh, he writes a lot in his letters, and you can see a lot of his thinking behind how do you, you know, build a church. And so in chapters 12 and 14, he talks about the gifts, which is what a lot of this year, this next year, is going to focus on, coming into our unwrapping the gifts that we already have in Christ. But right around 12 and 14, I don't know if you could fully see that, but he always goes back to the gospel, and he goes back to the concept of love. And I feel like this is such a, a powerful picture for us in understanding this and knowing that the gifts and us functioning in our purpose and our design is always melded between the issue of love, the reality of the gospel, 
Chapter 15, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel that we'll preach. Chapter 11, I talked about communion. And chapter 13, what's that one about? That's a famous little passage of scripture, right? Yeah. Well, the apostle John tells us that Jesus is love itself. God is love, all right? So God is the very essence of who love is. So when you read 1 Corinthians 13, somebody shout out some of the lines from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. Love, come on, I know you guys know. You've been to a million and one weddings. You've heard this. Love is long-suffering. What else? It's not self-seeking. It, what no evil? Thinks no evil. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Love keeps no record of wrongs. It's not envious and it's not rude, right? Yeah. Okay. So when you see 1 Corinthians 13, you're looking into a mirror of who God is. You're looking into uh, just this beautiful pool of water of seeing the reflection of God and seeing and understanding more of who his character is. But of course, we also know that we are united in Christ. We are one with him. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, it is a mirror because we're seeing our true identity as well because we are made one spirit with Christ. And so I'm always gonna bring it back to this. I'm always gonna bring it back to this communion reality, to this reality of our union with God. I believe this was the early church's secret. There's a lot of people who talk about you know the early church and if we just did this like the early church we would have revival you know all these different things and a lot of it's good you know they'll say like you know if we just met in homes more you know we'll we'll have revival like the early church if we just had more meals around our fellowship time we would have revival if we just practice signs and wonders more you know that would be the answer if we got rid of all controlling leaders and everything that would be the answer you know we go back to the book of acts and listen that's all good it's great to gather in homes it's great to get rid of controlling insecure leadership in the church. It's great to uh, get to have signs and wonders and pursue all that stuff. But the early church's secret was that they understood their union with Christ. They understood their union with the one who is love. And so they unashamedly called themselves little Christs. Like it wasn't the transliterated word Christian that to us today sounds like, you know, just we're, we're a part of this club and Christ is the leader of the club and he's over here and we're all gathering around him and we're all the Christians in this club. No, there was originally little Christ and I'm gonna keep beating this into our heads to understand this. They had this in their consciousness, this, their understanding in their heart of hearts that they were Christ. They were Christ. When you're one with something, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's much separation between, I, is there? I mean, no, when you're made one with something, I know it's intense, but this is the mystery of the gospel. And that word mystery, it's like mystical. It's something that's hidden. It's something that goes beyond our rational mind. It's, it's a truth that trumps our experience, but we are one with Jesus. So they didn't call themselves little Adams anymore. <laughs> they didn't go by, they weren't Adamites. They didn't call themselves little Adams. They didn't identify with the broken, sinful, sick, cursed population around them. They called themselves little Christ, and they could actually say Galatians 2.20, not just quote it because they were taught it as a little kid, and it's in the Bible, amen, glory, hallelujah, but I mean really saying Galatians 2.20. Imagine really meaning this. I'm still getting there. I have been crucified with Christ. I died, and it's no longer I who live. Yet, I do live, but not I. It's Christ living in me. Mm. See, when we get this, when we see this, it begins to change everything. And it changes also how we see each other, too. I mean, imagine not only seeing yourself in Christ, but how about, how about your spouse, <laughs> Okay, how about, how about your friends? How about the people that annoy you in church? <laughs> how about seeing everyone as Christ, in Christ? Imagine that. I think we treat people a little bit differently, right? 
I just have to share one story, and then we have something very special for you that we're going to close with. I'm actually going to ask uh, Jimmy Asen over here to come up. Jimmy uh, is going to share a song with us uh, in a moment. But um, oh, I was listening to a guy named Bill uh, Vanderbush preach uh, recently. Bill is an amazing um, teacher of, uh, of grace and the finished work of Christ. I saw him at Resting Place in New Jersey, uh, West Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, I'm hoping to have him here, this guy, sometime soon. But anyway, Bill shared this story where he was ministering at a conference. And it was the first night of the conference, and this lady comes up to him in tears and just asked for him to pray for her because she was getting ready to divorce her husband. And uh, she said, you know, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm you know... Uh, he, she, she went into a little bit of detail about her husband and just the kind of guy gets home, opens up a can of beer, sits on the couch, watches TV and zones out, does not contribute anything to the household, expects to be fed and all this kind of stuff, you know? So she's, you know, been living in this for, I don't know how many years, but it was a while. And she said, I've tried, I've tried and tried to make things work, but they're not working. So I'm divorcing. So just, just pray for me. Just, just, you know, can you pray for me, uh, in this? And Bill says to her, um, you know, I just want you to try something for me before I pray for you on the whole divorce thing, okay? I just want you to try something tonight, okay? We're in the middle of this conference. Just give something a shot, all right? Um, I want you to go home, and I want you to look at your husband. I want you to pray for grace to do this, but I want you to look at your husband, and I want you to see Jesus and not him. I want you to see Jesus there on that, on that chair, on that couch. So the woman's like, I don't know, um, but... I, you know, okay, I'll give it a shot. So she goes home, and uh, same routine as usual. Husband gets home. He's sitting on the couch just watching TV. Didn't have anything anything to drink, though. And so she's, she's looking at him, and she's like, okay, if this was Jesus sitting in my living room right now, what would I do? She said, you know what? I'd probably get him something to drink. I'd probably serve him. And so she goes to the refrigerator and she gets him a bottle of beer, a can of beer, and she goes and she serves him this uh, can of beer. And then she goes and she cooks him a meal and serves him this meal. And the husband notices something's wrong right away, like, <laughs> what's going on? And um, she sits there and she just lets him kind of keep doing his business, but she's looking at him with these, like, these fresh eyes, like, oh my gosh, like, she starts seeing Jesus in him, and, and her heart begins to melt. Like, she, there's something that gets unlocked in the hardness around her heart, and she starts weeping, and he sees this, and they start talking. He's like, what's going on? And she just expresses her love for him, and he's just absolutely floored by it. Okay, so, they're at the conference the second day, this guy Bill is preaching, and all of a sudden, he sees this same lady come up to him for prayer at the end of the second session, but she's with a guy. And she brought her husband with her to the conference, and she's crying, and this guy's crying, and she says, Bill, 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 th this is my husband. This is who I told you about. And, um, oh, man, it was a lot more powerful when I heard the story the first time, but it was beautiful how God just began to rework things just by seeing Jesus, you know? Um, so I want us to kind of meditate on this, all right? We just kind of poured out a lot this morning. There was a lot in that video, right? Sometimes we just take the food home with us and we don't chew on it. I want to chew on it. I want to think about it. Uh, this, this is my good friend, Jimmy. You've, many of you have met him and seen him before. Jimmy, uh, um, Jimmy ministered to us musically. Uh, about two years ago when he was here. I know many of you are here for that. And I asked him if he could just play for us again, and I didn't really have an agenda, but he told me a song that he had on, on his heart, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. That's exactly what would fit with this message. So he's gonna sing a song called Love Will Hold Us Together. Mm. So Lord, I do pray for such uh, revelation this year and the year ahead of what glues us, what holds us together, what brings us together. Lord, I thank you that there is such an acceleration before us, Lord. I thank you that, that Lord, so many of the gifts within people are gonna be unlocked this year like never before. I just wanna prophesy that right now. I feel that burning within me that there are people here who have been maybe for years 
I mean, years and years for some, and maybe it's just been in recent weeks for others, that there has been a burning within you to release the gifts and the passions and the dreams within you, and you have felt stuck, and you have felt immobilized at many times, and frustrated in so many different levels, but there is a release that the Lord has for his people this year. He is calling us into position this year to step into the fullness of our identity and our function together as one. And it's gonna be quick. I'm telling you, there is a quick work that God is doing in forming this body together and bringing us as one together. So we thank you for that, Father. But Lord, I pray as we begin to move forward into this that the love of the Spirit, the love of the gospel, the love that flows from the cross would just splash all over us, Lord, that it would just douse us like never before, that we would come together, Lord, in selflessness and patience and kindness and mercy, believing all things, hoping all things, trusting all things. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are listening to a podcast from the Journey Church of the Highlands. It is our joy to share and release the gospel of God's love, grace, and Jesus' finished work on the cross. For more information, please visit awakenj.com.